Good evening and welcome to True Stories. Tonight we look at the Vietnam conflict through the eyes of Australian men and women. Relive their experiences and emotions in The Sharp End, Witnesses of Vietnam. Our military power continues to grow. This power is for our own defense and to deter aggression. We shall not be aggressors, but we and our allies have and will maintain a massive capability to strike back. President, have you ever had any reason to doubt the so-called domino theory? I believe it. I think that the uh, struggle is close enough. China is so large, moon so high on the just beyond the frontiers. South Vietnam went, it would not only give them an improved geographic position for a guerrilla assault on Malaya, but would also give the impression that the way of the future in Southeast Asia is China and the Communists. I don't think that uh, the true Australian wants safety on the cheap. Nor does he want to leave everything to other people. It's abundantly clear that Australia must be prepared to do its share. And I'm perfectly certain that that will be agreeable to Australian opinion. Renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. When uh, conscription was introduced, I was, uh, I took it as being just another part of my life and uh, we'd move on into a, 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 another adventure. Um, I was looking forward to it. Well, I don't think I liked the idea of it anyway, taking the young fellas away when they had so many regular soldiers. I was a volunteer and uh, I was glad that I volunteered to serve the colours. I had to register for the very first uh, ballot at the beginning of 65 and uh, I was quite shocked. I, at that stage, I wasn't uh, um, necessarily opposed to conscription it's, itself, but the first thing I asked myself was, you know, what am I being conscripted for? I felt quite threatened that a busload of women would arrive at the gates of Pakapanya with their banners, save our sons. We used to hand out leaflets uh, saying, uh, you have a right to be conscious as a projector. Uh, and just as the uh, young men were going through the gates, one turned round to me and said, I don't want to go, I've changed my mind, will you help me? The troops that went there volunteered to go. I mean, I don't care what anyone says, they were given a chance to pull out and nothing would have been said. Well, he did like the idea of it. He did like the idea of going away. But he said that he, he wasn't a coward, he said his number come out, so he'd go. I went to uh, fight the communist aggressor from the north, as Bob Menzies kept on telling us all the time. Well, to stop them coming down there and running into Australia. Then early in 1965, we were told that we were going to join the 1st Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment and we drove from Holesbury to Richmond Air Base I don't think there's a lot of apprehension because uh, we were volunteers for the regular army and this is what we trained to do. So we wanted to get into the planes and get up to Vietnam and see if we were any good. We had trained and trained hard and trained well and, and more importantly trained together. And uh, I believe we were as well trained as we could be. Dominant memory, dom dominant recollection is boys own camp type thing. Off to a great adventure. Uh, I think the journos that were on board the ship, and there were only four of us, felt it as strongly probably as the troops did. We were excited, uh, maybe apprehensive, but we were certainly excited because this is the job we'd been trained to do and uh, we wanted to go and do the real thing. The Vietnam situation was a, a very great leap into a much bigger war than we'd faced in Malaya. The army were very good. They told us things about the country, uh, the customs, the religions, the politics. I got the impression the authority was not the slightest bit interested in the history of 
the country that were, they were going to? Nobody was worried because at that age, 19, 20, 22, uh, nothing's going to happen to you personally. It's always going to be someone else. So our expectations were that, yes, we would be meeting the Viet Cong uh, sooner rather than later. Any time that uh, we got out of the aircraft, in fact, we were you know, quite looking forward to it. Next thing, we were whizzing along the highway and they seemed to have absolutely no concern for human life or property in the way they drove this bus with the mesh up at the windows and somebody sort of asked the question, you know, what, why do we, what are we fenced in for? And then they indicated that that, that was to keep the hand grenades out and we shut up then. When we arrived at Bien Air Base, we were astounded to see that we were being put into an enormous grassy paddock and there were no trees or anything the highly trained Australian jungle scientists to tie their little tents to. Earlier this week, HMAS Sydney, with its load of troops and equipment, slipped quietly out of harbour on the first stage of its long voyage to South Vietnam. And with its departure, the commitment of Australia to the war going on there began in earnest. There were interminable classes. My recollection is most of them were health classes. It was, oh, well, identification of the enemy and health classes. For God's sake, you know, stay away from, from, from the women up there because you, there's, there's strains of VD and gonorrhea you would not believe, you know, and you'll never come home and you'll be stuck in a hospital for the rest of your life. It was actually a little bit frightening because uh, we'd had uh, the briefing from the intelligence people uh, I think Major Peter Young, if I recall, came up to tell us about these Viet Cong. And uh, we were actually convinced that these fellows were 10 feet tall and that they could probably cut your throat with their toenails. When I arrived at shore at Vung Tower, I was pretty sure I was in a war and um, I could feel the war was all around me. Well, one RAI went to Vietnam to be attached to an American brigade. Uh, we were attached then to 173rd at Bien Hoa, whose task was to defend the Bien Hoa Air Base against Viet Cong attack. So initially that was our task. We haven't got a problem really, just we've got to get used to the American uh, idea. We seem to do things different than they do. Uh, it's interesting working with them. We've never worked with them before. We thought they were a very good and elite group of soldiers. After we arrived, we found that, uh, in fact, they knew next to nothing about jungle warfare as we understood it. Uh, the big cultural difference, I think, was, uh, one, we believed in, in patience, planning and stealth, whereas I think the Americans wanted to get the war over very quickly, and so theirs was mainly bravado and aggression. It's a bad time we call it home at times. It's good to get back here for a bit of a rest, although they still have pickets to do and so on. We get our issue of beer, which is uh, perhaps the best recreation for most of us in this uh, hot, dry, dusty weather. In uh, early 66, the Americans realised that uh, the headquarters of the Viet Cong and their both the logistic operations uh, headquarters were in the Harbour Wood somewhere. Uh, it had been a, a place that the Viet Men had used in, uh, in French times and that it was laced with tunnels and this is all they knew. And the idea was, was the Australians had land along the line of the villages and block while the American battalions landed on the other side and preceded by a B-52 strike, would sweep through the rubber plantations, capture this headquarters and score a glorious victory. Well, we, went into, we went into the Hobo, Hobo Woods on the 8th of January. Um, from the, basically from the moment we got off the helicopters, um, we started getting contacts. We did run into one foolish uh, fellow who wanted to engage us uh, with his uh, m uh, small arms fire, and he suddenly found that there was uh, 22 soldiers advancing towards him with uh, 
two or three helicopters sitting off uh, 50 yards to the rear of us. And after thinking about it for a little while, he decided to throw the weapon away and uh, disappear. They, they turned the corner about 30 feet from me. And uh, I think I looked away or something at that particular time. And then when I turned around, I realised that the first, the first guy in this patrol that was coming back was a Viet Cong. And we didn't know at the time, but uh, this washout had a tunnel running along the side of it and a series of firing slits, and the enemy proceeded to uh, fire at uh, my soldiers, very close range. And uh, Corporal Smith got uh, hit, uh, Private Delaney got hit. And by the time I raised the machine gun up, to, um, to fire, it was about a foot and a half from the front of the machine gun. I pulled the trigger. He had another six or seven guys behind him. And when I fired the rounds, they were, I was watching through the sights and they were just pouring into his head and his head was just exploding. Uh, but the the fire from the machine gun was actually holding this guy up. It wasn't allowing him to fall onto the ground. We continued to push forward and uh, I think uh, around about that time, uh, I went out to help Delaney and as I was pulling him back uh, into some shelter, I got hit from about uh, uh, very close range, a couple of inches. I ended up with powder burns on my lip. Uh, and I dropped the lady in front of the slit. It wasn't until after then that the shock started to hit me as I started wiping bits of his brains and so forth like that off the end of my machine gun. Um, that's why Hobo Woods... I don't remember much of what happened through the rest of the time of Hobo Woods because my mind was taken up with what had occurred at that particular time. I thought I might as well try and do my job while I was there. In fact, I, I was terrified, to be quite honest. <laughs> I recall almost uh, having the feeling that I wanted to run, but uh, I suppose because someone had educated me sufficiently, I, I didn't run. I, I wasn't quite sure whether I was going to make it at that stage, but they threw me on a, on a chopper. I was sitting on a dicky seat on the side, and, there was this big black American sergeant, there was his machine gun there as a door gunner. And he's obviously the crew chief because he said to me, he said, uh, hey guy, would you like a copy of the Stars and Stripes? Well, here I am, you know, my both eyes are closed and there's blood pouring out my mouth. And I said to him, I said, hey, I can't read. And he said, I don't want you to read it, I want you to put it on the floor because your blood's messing my helicopter up. <laughs> Mungle. <laughs> uh, anyway. I regret that when we actually searched this guy, that he was only 18 years old. And to put that into context, I was only just 19 as well, you know. There was only 20, out of the 22 blokes in my platoon that went out of that operation after it was uh, wound up three or four days later, they, uh, there was only 11 of them that walked back and the rest had holes in them. One of the most frightening things that, that hit us as soon as we hit the Hobo Woods, particularly at the LZ, we ran into these extensive tunnel systems that we were not expecting. The tunnels um, were absolutely massive. It grew day by day by day. After two days, the fellows who were clearing them were absolutely worn out. So the boss then decided, was all hands to the pump, and uh, suddenly the smiling radio operators were down the holes as well, and we weren't then smiling, I can tell you. Yeah, well, the earliest techniques of going down tunnels was, first of all, going down head first, with a bayonet in one hand and a torch in the other. And, of course, this meant that we had no protection. Once you did the end of the tunnel, it was elongated. It was like getting into a coffin. We didn't really understand the importance of tunnels and how big this was and all this sort of stuff, you know, until, until we pulled out so much intelligence, you know, like 100,000 sheets of paper we pulled out of this, besides all the tons and tons of explosives. So you'd come along down the first tunnel and you'd find a trapdoor. Once you cleared that, you'd go down to the next tier, which was straight down. Then you'd crawl along and you'd find another trapdoor. It wasn't until all the um, uh, information was disseminated and looked at by the, by the intelligence organisations that they said, hey, this is really valuable stuff. Turned right, and the torchlight all I saw was two eyes looking at me. 
And I shot back around the corner and I thought, what's that? So I put a pistol around the corner and I put the torch around when I switched it on. There was a dog sitting there, buddy, growling at me. So I promptly got a bit frustrated and put nine rounds into it. We actually searched these tunnel systems for five days. And at the end of that time, they were going in both directions, still completing. We searched out three quarters of a mile. What else could you do? Because you didn't know what was going on. Who was there? You just snuck along nice and careful and kept your pistol ready. We were part of a major force of, uh, uh, of 173rd Airborne Brigade, so we were only one battalion group. And as such, uh, we were told that we were needed to withdraw because the whole of the brigade is withdrawing. Wow, were we disappointed to withdraw. <laughs> I wasn't disappointed, I can tell you that right now. But they tell me there was 5,000 fully armed troops down there. Thank Christ they kept moving. The 1st Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment, marched through the streets of Sydney on the 8th of June 1966 to a tumultuous Waltham. There was a lady who covered herself in red paint and ran into the CO, and uh, I think that was, was a real eye-opener to a lot of fellows, that there was that depth of opposition. Can you see any limit to the extent of our military commitment to South Vietnam? Um, I don't believe that our military commitment to South Vietnam would, can in the present situation, go much beyond the present commitment. Over the next year, the Army worked towards assembling a task force. At the same time, the Americans were asking us for more troops, and Harold Holt finally gave his agreement that a task force be sent. And it wasn't until the government made the announcement that the battalion got all the priority it needed to be filled up with troops and get all the priority in training. And in fact, we, we had about 90 days from that announcement until we were ready to go. Uh, 1966, we were the first, uh, first ones into Nui Dat. Uh, well, the impressions when I arrived, nice scenery, nice rubber plantation, where are we going to live? Um, and, and they virtually said, well, when you get something built, that's where you're going to live. Uh, the food was uh, terrible, the accommodation was uh, basically hoochies and eventually um, 16 to 16 tents. But the, uh, because it was a monsoon season, the mud was everywhere. Uh, and the, uh, the weapon pits were full of water. Well, patrolling is the bread and butter of the infantry man. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, it's more stale bread than butter, and you, uh, it's it's very boring and very repetitive, and it's uh, something that's just done day after day after day. Carrying something like a hundred pounds of equipment that seems determined to cut through your shoulders. You're hungry all the time, you're thirsty all the time, tired all the time, of course. And when combat comes, you have to face the ridiculous task of trying to run through jungle carrying a hundred pounds or more of equipment, knowing full well that the people you're fighting are carrying half a dozen rounds of ammunition in their pocket and couldn't quite easily outrun you. The enemy worked on the principle that, that it was essential for him to have the support of the people. He could obtain food, medical supplies, he could obtain labour when he wanted it, and recruits for his army. He could also, most importantly, merge with the people so that we, the foreigners, could not determine friend from foe. It's just continuous patrolling. We, we, we spent half a year in the jungle, and uh, the only time you've seen them bastards was well, when they let, you, they let go a burst of AK-47 down the centre of it, buzzing past your ears. When you're in contact with somebody, um it becomes very personalised that someone's trying to kill you or you're always trying to kill them. You can feel as if um, you may be going to the happy hunting ground at any time. Now, you were there five minutes ago, and now you're not. And in half an hour, I'm wrapping you up in a poncho and sending you home. That is bad news. There was a bang, and I went up and through the air, and I can remember dust and the ringing in my ears, and. Everybody's screaming for medics and dust off helicopters, and I just left lying there looking into the sun. You were, you were halting the deterioration of the soldiers' medical condition as, or surgical condition as much as possible so that they were alive until they got to the uh, hospital. You stopped bleeding, you filled in sucking chest wounds so that that, uh, that didn't kill them on the trip.
the role for the dust off for our aircraft was no more difficult than the standard mission that you happen to be flying at the time. You'd pick up the, uh, the patient, take him to the nearest hospital or the head hospital if necessary. That was a big morale booster for uh, the troop on the ground because he knew darn well if he got hurt, he had a fair chance of being pulled out very quickly and he could be in a hospital within 10 or 15 minutes. The dust off system was a very efficient system. Uh, we would have warning wherever we were around the hospital as the choppers were coming in. Well, I actually thought I'd woken up in a storeroom, but um, I realised now it was night time and they used to use Christmas tree lights for night lighting. And that's what made me think I was in a storeroom because I thought I'd been put out the back with the leftover Christmas decorations. I knew back out on the minefield that I'd lost my leg, that, that I just felt that my leg had been blown off. And I can remember saying to the nurse, have I lost my leg? And she went into a little bit of a panic and said, I'll get the doctor, I'll get the doctor to talk to you. One particular case I remember with a mine was a young lieutenant who stepped backwards onto a, um, a mine. And when he came in on the helicopter, uh, he didn't appear to be grossly damaged until we lifted him from the uh, stretcher. And at that stage, it was obvious that the mine had sheared most of his back away. Because the mines contained um, pellets of lead, nails, anything that could be bought, um, airborne when it was exploded, so that they had many, many multiple fragment wounds. And so it might not just be an arm or a leg, it would be the whole body. In our hospital, the, uh, there was only one trained operating theatre nurse, and the rest of the lads were uh, medical assistants trained as operating theatre technicians. I can recall that we had a, a farmer, a uh, shoe salesman, Peter and Turner, a couple of uni students who had uh, been called up into national service and in one year had been trained as medical assistants and then operating theatre technicians. I think that uh, it asked an awful lot of those young people, you know, to see uh, such terrible, terrible wounds and uh, I think they acquitted themselves marvellously. Many Australians, like many Americans, disagree with President Johnson's actions in Vietnam. But those who agree must wonder what Australia would do if there was a dramatic switch in American policy. I hope uh, there will be a corner of your mind and heart which takes cheer from the fact that you have an admiring friend, a staunch friend, that will be all the way with LBJ. I recall going to bed and, oh, about one o'clock in the morning, I hear the pop, 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 which was a little bit different. Uh, it sort of uh, uh, let me feel that they were incoming rounds, and sure enough, they were, and they started landing somewhere around the task force area. You don't usually put a mortar attack in unless you're going to do something else with it. So, you know, and the, uh, the, the natural thing to do is put in a mortar attack as a precursor to a, an infantry assault. I recall uh, jumping out of bed, putting on my jungle patrol boots, back the front on the wrong feet, racing down to the command post under the ground and then just uh, waiting and listening to all the radio reports of the various actions that were going on. Well, the reaction uh, to the task force base after the mortaring was that they, uh, they sent out uh, one of the other companies, B Company, to um, try and find out where the mortars had come from. Uh, Noel and his company found a number of mortar positions, I think three recoilless rifles, 70 millimetre gun and uh, mortar positions. And um, we were ordered um, then the next morning to go out and relieve Noel Ford because his company weren't equipped to stay out for an extended period of time. On the 18th of August, just after we uh, uh, relieved B Company, uh, outside the rubber where they'd found the base plates of the uh, mortars, uh, we moved off and uh, uh, into towards the rubber. Trees around about six to nine inches across, trees about uh, 20 feet high with a bit of green on the top. Not a complete blanket. The thing that was getting up everyone's nose on the way out was that we were missing the Cold Joy and Little Paddy concert and we could hear grabs of sound from the concert as we were moving out. I had the section on the extreme left of 11 platoon. We'd probably gone into the rubber about uh, somewhere about uh, 100 metres and uh, we were hit with uh, a fair bit of fire coming in on our section. Uh, I believe that probably because of the volume of fire 
Uh, but 11 platoon, in fact, may have been overrun, and then I uh, dispatched 10 platoon around to the left flank to try and uh, help get 11 platoon out. We never got to 11 platoon. We never got... It, we never got close enough to see 11 platoon. Not that we got identified anyway. I was his platoon sergeant of uh, 11 platoon, and Gordon was on his hands and knees looking around to see where Charlie was, and he was only 30 metres away, and I'd said to him, now, if you don't pull your head down, you're going to get bloody killed. And he said, turned to me and he said, there's no one out there good enough, and the next time he shot, put his head up, he got shot straight to the throat. A lot of us thought, what in the hell's going on here? Why are they coming at us? You know, uh, uh, and we could see that they were very well equipped, they were well dressed, they were uh, regular soldiers, and not the uh, pyjama clad uh, crew that uh, we'd been told about. Because, you, you know, there were a lot of tracer, and you could see the tracer. And uh, an incredible volume of fire, you know, it really was. This sort of fight you felt if you stuck your head up and it would get shot off for sure. And subsequently, as the battle developed, uh, we tended to protect ourselves behind Gordon's body, and you could hear the additional rounds hitting him, you know. That's how close they were. The only thing that stopped them uh, overrunning us early in the piece was the artillery that was coming in. This was the first time in my experience uh, that uh, the Viet Cong had uh, stayed around after the artillery, after the first uh, encounter. Uh, they knew that they were well and truly within range of our artillery, and so they must have had some fairly evil designs on that company or on the uh, task force. And then, of course, the rain started. Weather conditions were pissing down with monsoonal rain. And I thought, you know, maybe the easiest way out of here is to attack straight ahead. Well, from round about uh, five o'clock in the afternoon through to about uh, about uh, seven o'clock or eight o'clock, the fire was continuous, uh, and so the guns fired at a rate about every 10 seconds and 20 seconds. And that meant that landing on the battlefield uh, around Delta Company was something like 800 pounds of high explosive every 10 or 20 seconds. The sound and the, uh, the whistling, the thumping of the ground, the shattering of shrapnel, um, it was deafening. I took a run out to the extreme left of my section to uh, try and get the men back into, into closer to the platoon headquarters and, uh, and I then saw that most of, uh, most of them were then dead. Now, while the artillery was still coming in, uh, yeah, and we still had voices on the radio, we knew that uh, the rest of the company is still there and there's no way that you're going to get up and stand up with a white towel and say, come and get me. You know, that just didn't enter in anyone's mind. CO and Major Honor were looking at a map across the table, very worried. In fact, the operations officer, Major Passy, briefed me and told me to pick up A Company and get out to D Company and break up the attack. Drew the general location on my map and that was my formal orders for the day. It started to get dark and uh, visibility dropped to... 25, 30 metres, uh, it decided to, I decided to take a run back, make it, try and make a clean break and go, and then uh, reconsolidate about 150 metres behind us. This wasn't supposed to be happening, you know. This, uh, we, were, we were supposed to be uh, giving these uh, VC with a, a sandal and an old Mauser rifle uh, a hiding, and here they were. They, were. they were giving us a pretty good touch-up at that stage. I looked around and most of the... Uh... Most of my mates had gone and had been shot, and um, I pulled a grenade from uh, uh, that I had there, and I thought, well, I wasn't going to go with them, so uh, I had that ready, and I couldn't couldn't use the rifle, but I thought if there's one way out, we might have to use this. And we knew we were having trouble with our weapons. We knew we were having trouble with the rain and the mud, and I thought that. This is going to be it, you know, one more assault. We just can't feed the weapons the way we were at that stage. And a very clear recollection to the artillery, you know, it was, that certainly was an incredible thing to see. The, art, the, the artillery would come down behind the assault wave and the, the second line just be wiped out like a pack of cards. <laughs> just wiped clean. And then we, we were, in each case, able to stop the, the assault wave with rifle fire. But that happened at least twice, two that I can remember quite clearly, two assaults like that. Uh, major, probably company size assaults. There in front of us was a complete company of infantry moving from left to right across our front in arrowhead formation, dressed in greens, packs on their back. And in the rain, it looked as though they were part of, in fact, I thought it's D Company. About the same time as I had that thought, my right hand carrier, C Corporal Goss, 
call out on the radio, it's the enemy and open fire. I could say masses of enemy were approaching us, but I would say in the vicinity of three or four hundred to our front. We didn't hear the APCs arrive because of the, the, the artillery and the rain, but when they did arrive, uh, it was um, just like one of those Western movies, I suppose, where the cavalry turns up. Um, once the APCs arrived, there was no further firing. Well, when uh, when we racked when we rolled in, uh, the uh, some of the guys actually sort of stood up and clapped. Um, I understand uh, from one of my NCOs that one of the guys actually came up and sort of hugged the side of the carrier. We hit the start line and we all got out of the tracks and sort of looked around and uh, so quiet that was the the thing, a few birds singing, that was all. And we started to focus on bodies and bodies and bits of bodies and more bodies, and it was uh, started to hit everyone then. The official count was 245 enemy bodies. I personally probably saw the best part of 100. I was quite shocked when I uh, saw the way my platoon was spread out in a straight line like they were, not moving, fingers on the trigger and still rounds in their rifles that they were killed, squeezed off a shot or something like that. And Vic Rice, my operator, got uh, killed as we withdrew and he was shot through the chest and he was sitting up there with the radio still still working with a smile on his face. It, uh, it's something that I'll always remember. Uh, so it's not... I don't get upset about it today, but it's something that I always remember as the guys that were with me. What dead we had recovered, we'd put in the back of an APC, and then with the movement of the APC over some 3,000 metres, when the tailgate of the APC dropped open, the bodies were more uh, were all in, intermingled. Um, I knew each and every one of them, and the boys were surprised and shocked to see their their own in that position in the back of the APC. We took 108, uh, including three New Zealanders into Long Tan, so 105 Australians, and we lost 18 dead, and I think the APCs lost one dead. When we went back to the lines, and um, there was a couple of my 11 return people were there, and uh, they were folding up the beds of those that had been killed and wounded, and it was very, uh, very emotional. To, to see the empty beds and the bunks being folded up. The army car came down the road with an army man in it and the padre, one of the padres, and they came and knocked on the door. The husband went out at first to answer the door and he called me out and I knew straight away something must have been wrong. But I, I mean, I couldn't cry. I didn't cry, I don't think, for nearly three weeks. I couldn't, you know, I was so numb. He was killed on the 18th of August, and uh, that was an exhibition Thursday. And I was home minding half of the grandchildren. Then we didn't get the news until the Saturday morning. On the 20th, we got the news of his death. Oh, well, I don't know. I just think he should be home, you know, with us instead of being where he was at the time. But, you know, it's just one of those things that happened, you know. Mm. And I would like for every Aussie that stands there in the rice paddies on this warm summer day to know that every American and LBJ is with Australia all the way. The 1960s, the United States became convinced that the only way they could stave off defeat in Vietnam was to apply massive amounts of firepower on land, on sea and by air. We didn't go as far all the way as the rhetorics uh, implied. To match the Americans proportionally in terms of population, 
the Australian effort would have had to have been about three times what, in fact, it was. The Americans said we're a bit short on the ground for aircrew, and uh, the Australian Defence Force looked around to see what it had, and, of course, there was a fairly large number of Australian Navy uh, helicopter aircrew at the time. The, the EMU company, the 135th uh, Aviation Company, was an infant, infantry support company. The, the name EMU came from the Americans. They were very keen that uh, they have an Australian bird, uh, a bird that was aggressive and fast. Uh, what they didn't know, and when I told them, they were terribly disappointed that the EMU didn't fly. The RAN deployed four ships to Vietnam during the period from March 67 until October 1971. Hobart was the first, it was followed by Perth and later by Brisbane and also by Vendetta. We were assigned uh, naval gunfire support duties on the gun line, which is the uh, operation which was conducted south of the demilitarized zone at that time. All Ford air controllers in Vietnam were assigned to the United States Air Force, which was based in Saigon, had its headquarters there. Our role was to locate the target, locate the position of friendly uh, forces, and to mark the target for the fighter aircraft. And then the aircraft puts a run in, and a, and a bomb aimer is in the nose looking through a bomb sight and telling the pilot, left, left, steady, right, steady, etc. And, uh, and then running up to the target, the bomb's gone. And we took the, the simplistic view that every uh, member of the enemy that we knocked over uh, could save the lives of our own troops. And that was a very important uh, message that was in all our hearts. And uh, the squadron, really, that was our raison d'etre. <laughs> We Vietnamese would spend Tet at least four days celebrating Tet, the last day of the old year and the first three or four days of the new year. But because we Vietnamese practice what is called the cult of ancestors, it's also a religious affair. Well, I was working for Reuters News Agency, which is based at 85 Fleet Street, London, and uh, I was wandering around covering the war and I'd been there for nearly 12 months so I was joining in the festivities and they were bringing in truckloads of flowers and the streets were lined with flowers particularly the Nguyen Hue Street and um, I was wandering around thinking how lucky I was that I had got through the Vietnam War without being killed. People thought well obviously there'll be nothing happening now until after the holidays and, and this was traditional because both sides observed a truce during the Lunar New Year. Well, you would think that a truce would be an easy time for reporters, but, uh, you know, news, news agencies love the story of when the truce is broken. There was a uh, very loud noise after we'd just gone to bed after a New Year's Eve party, and my wife said to me, what was that noise? Well, I was a military expert, and I immediately said, thunder. <laughs> and she said, that's not thunder, it's the dry season. On the nights of January 30th and 31st, it was clear that the situation in Vietnam was drastically different. The Viet Cong simultaneously attacked just about every major city and town in South Vietnam. It was Tet, the Oriental New Year, and it was a new war. The war came to Saigon early in the morning of January 31st. The first target was the symbol of the American presence in Vietnam, the United States Embassy. I couldn't believe the scene that I saw because there were, there were old black Citroen cars full of bullet holes up the side like in the movies and there were dead American MPs next to their Jeep and there were Americans behind every tree along the street opposite. It was an attack. It involved about 10 persons who were all killed. But it only lasted about a day. But if you read American dispatches at the time, for about two weeks, there was nothing but that attack on the American embassy. There was nothing else. Hue, the loveliest city in Vietnam, was burning. A great battle was fought not to defend Hue, but to retake it. When the counterattack came, almost all of Hue was in enemy hands. This wasn't any normal firefight. This was something really on. And uh, I thought, we'll blow this for a game of soldiers. What's going to happen next? There was a myriad of colours. There was tracer, there was artillery firing. There was anything that you could possibly think of in the weaponry system, they're all having their little go. 
Hanoi was the Rome of the, the Vietnamese, the hub of Vietnam. In my particular case, in my company, the men's homes were there. Their families lived in there. Our headquarters were in there. And the last news we'd got is our headquarters had been overrun. In fact, our, one of my platoons was wiped out in there when they were overrun. And this went on for 28 days, virtually, 27 days. Well, at times, it, it was uh, as savage a fighting as you'll see anywhere. There was a lot of sniping going on. We linked up with the right of the American Marine Battalion that had uh, been sent into way to try and uh, clear it, and they were complaining about all the casualties they were taking. You lost any friends? Quite a few. We lost one the other day. Whole thing. Stink. Awful sick of it. I'll be so glad to go home. I don't know. It's just it's the worst area we've been in since I've been in Vietnam. The Arvin Battalion I was serving with was given the job of taking the area around the flagpole and removing the NVA flag that was flying and to replace it with the South Vietnamese flag. It was late in the evening, it was starting to get a little dark, and then there was nothing, just flares. And it was, it was an indication that things had stopped. But it was quite dramatic. There was a definite pause. Everything went still. I think the thing that sticks mainly in my mind is the atrocities we uncovered when the population who were delib members of the population were deliberately assassinated, executed. I would say assassinated. Execute gives some legality to it. They weren't. They were assassinated by the North Vietnamese Army. The battalion left the task force area on the 24th of January on Operation Coburg. Now we knew that this was going to be uh, a longer operation and therefore it would go over the Tet period. The main role of our battalion uh, during Operation Coburg was to prevent the movement of the NBA down to the Long Bin area to destroy the infrastructure there. It was apparent that there was no VC uh, in the area, and they were all NVA, and they didn't know the area because uh, they were North Vietnamese coming down through from Cambodia. The platoon would go out early in the morning, lay up for an ambush, put it alongside a track, wait for the NVA to come along. We'd have a shoot up, uh, and then we'd uh, stop for lunch, and uh, then get ready and have another one in the afternoon. Probably the closest call I had, had this feeling I was being watched. I slowly turned my head to the left, and uh, there's this chap, uh, North Vietnamese, about six feet away, looking through the jungle, trying to find us. And uh, all of a sudden, our eyes locked onto one another. And uh, I beat him to the draw. And uh, that was that. The second Tet Offensive, now commonly called by all historians, the Battle for Saigon, was incredibly important because number one it allowed them to have more leverage at the Paris peace talks and number two it was meant to give uh, a birthday present for Ho Chi Minh. For most of the civilian population this was more of the same and not unexpected. Keep in mind that over half of Saigon's population had come already as refugees from the country areas and Saigon was supposed to be safe. It wasn't. It was just more despair for them. Just more. It was obvious to us that uh, the attack had started in Cholon. We drove northwards uh, towards Cholon uh, in the Minimoke. And I must say, in defence of uh, foreign correspondence, that was a very unusual th thing for uh, five of us to be in one jeep. Uh, we drove into the VEC back lines. They didn't attack us. We, we drove into uh, a fairly natural ambush. Copy 50, 10 VC. No, I hadn't seen them. They poured 10 seconds of automatic round over, above, around and through that jeep. And when they saw that we were not armed, I'm sure that they felt that they knew they'd made a mistake. I then think they took fright and uh, decided to finish us off. It was Michael Birch of Associated Press of Australia. Shouted out, pleadingly, desperately, bow oh, 
tea, Bao Tea. And he stopped. That is, the commander stopped. And he said, very right away, well, hell, Bao Tea. And he just shot. While he was reloading, that's, I took the opportunity to jump up and to uh, run in a zigzag way and to uh, escape. We were part of the uh, surgical team that was selected from the Royal Brisbane Hospital contingent. We were sent to the Benoit Civilian Hospital and we were given the surgical suite. We were treating the civilian population who were mainly casualties of war and the work, my belief, was band-aiding. A lot of us felt that we were Australians' conscience being there and that the stuff we were doing was patch-up, band-aid work and we knew that we were sending these people back out into a situation where they had poor food and poor hygiene, no clean water, and where there are accidents and warfare, and it felt like we were starting at the wrong end. I'll never forget um, the faith of these people. There was an acceptance of what was happening. We had a surgeon who was very good at hair lips and he did lots of hair lip surgery while he was there and it was really quite gratifying because you could see that we were doing hair lips for people and everyone was so glad to uh, have the surgery done. That was good. They came from the mountains, they came from the surrounding villages, they came from the marketplaces and we would often know that they were coming in very often with abdominal wounds, with their intestines, you know, exposed. Um, a leg blown off was very common eye injuries, facial injuries, etc. It was just like MASH. I mean, the, the, the trick about MASH is that it interpolates humour with really serious tragedy, and that's what this was like. We were half hysterical half the time. I suppose the worst little patch of things I can remember is uh, there were about a dozen people who got napalmed and that was terrible. We had nowhere to put them and nowhere to treat them. And they just died one after the other. And we saved, I think, two of them. And it was awful just having to watch them all die. Some of the team went over as doves and some went over as hawks. And those were the expressions used then about people who were pro-war or anti-war. And it was curious that no one appeared to change. Over the time we were there, everyone who was a hawk stayed a hawk and everyone who was a dove stayed a dove. I was a dove. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. It's an honour to meet men doing the job they have to do as well as you are doing it. And it's an encouragement to meet men doing a job which is of such importance to their nation now and in the future. Some armoured vehicles were moving up the road and were fired on for some unknown reason by enemy in the village of Binbar. So the task force commander then uh, got me to take my whole battalion up there and the uh, following two days uh, was almost a continuous battle. We moved up to the road near the village and we were fired upon with uh, heavy fire from RPGs which caused us to swing across the road into the open ground. The district chief and I went up in a helicopter and he broadcast in Vietnamese uh, warning both the enemy and any civilians who may have been there to clear out that an attack was about to take place. The infantry had uh, moved up with us and were riding in the back of the armed personnel carriers and they uh, took up position behind us, ready for us to sweep into the village and start clearing. The enemy were uh, established inside houses and inside... I. I put one man at the doorway for protection and I went into the house and proceeded to search the house. 
As I lifted up the uh, double bed that was in one of the rooms, there were two enemy soldiers underneath the bed. You can't be prepared for that sort of uh, action. As we drove through the village, RPG was fired at us and struck the side of the tank and wounded the turret crew. We abandoned the tank and left it, moved out to a point where a chopper fly in to take us out. Thought I had a large wound in my back, which just turned out to be a heat, a heat blast. I didn't get on the chopper at that stage. I uh, told my wife I had a nice, safe job in Nui Dat. And as soon as you get on a chopper, there's a wound in action telegram sent, and she was worried enough without getting something like that. I think the NVA were uh, scared of the tanks until Bin Bar. And for some reason, uh, they decided they would stay and have a go. I'm sure they regret it very much now. What happened after the, uh, the battle was over, that uh, we tried to repair the villages as much as we possibly could. Well, the civil affairs representatives, including myself, went into the village of Bing Ba the day after the battle to inspect the village to see what damage had been done. We made an assessment of the damage with a view to determining what sort of materials and what sort of work was necessary to make the buildings habitable again. So a sort of situation of relocation provided a good opportunity for the Viet Cong to exploit the resentment of the people which um, resulted from this relocation. To protect our men who are in Vietnam and to guarantee the continued success of our withdrawal and Vietnamization programs, I have concluded that the time has come for action. This is not an invasion of Cambodia. I thought they were a pack of rat bags, you know, university bludgers who didn't know what they are on about. Uh, we were there to do the job that, that we'd been trained to do, and to that extent the uh, protest movement was uh, an irritation and nothing more to us. I felt their actions were very un-Australian. And uh, one didn't really have much time to analyse why uh, people felt as they did, and we just got on with the job. was flourishing, movement on the roads, the markets were open. It was as if there was no war at all by the time the task force were leaving. It was pointless, the Australians remaining, because the task force really had nothing more to do in Phuc Thuy province. There were no enemy. Yeah, it was still hyped up. So we didn't have three weeks off before we came home. We just on a plane and back, and we just come out the jungle. I'm very pleased that I went there, but I certainly was glad to get home, particularly coming home unscathed. I was one of the lucky ones because I went over, came back the same way as I went over. I had a daughter at that stage. She was nine months old that I'd never seen. They arrived, they dispersed, and that was it. We really didn't sit down and talk about Vietnam. We talked about the future. Vietnam was the most interesting most frightening, most irritating, and most addictive time of that part of my life. Every single day that goes past, something relating to Vietnam comes to mind. Uh, there's no, there's no change in that, and there's no turning back from it. And some of them that had lost their only sons. I was quite lucky in a way because I had others. I'm aware the casualties of the war just don't happen on the battlefield. They, it's, uh, it's an ongoing thing and uh, certainly a lot of people are having problems which are still coming out today. I thought the protesters were a pack of bludgers protesting, not knowing what they were doing, but then I soon realised that uh, they were right and I think we were wrong. I don't think as a war it was any more sick than any other war that Australian soldiers have fought in. Uh, let's hope we never involve ourselves in another fiasco like that one.
I don't have any regrets whatsoever, none whatsoever. My only regret, perhaps, would be that I had to come home a little bit early. <laughs> we were a bit like a boat moving through the water. We created a wake, but when we moved on, the water settled down and all was as before. is boys own camp type thing off to a great adventure uh, I think the journos that were on board the ship and there were only four of us felt it as strongly probably as the troops did we were excited uh, maybe apprehensive we were certainly excited because this is a job we'd been trained to do and uh, we wanted to go and do the real thing the Vietnam situation was a, a very great leap into a much bigger war than we'd faced in Malaya the army were very good they told us things about the country, uh, the customs, the religions, the politics. I got the impression the authority was not the slightest bit interested in the history of the country that they were going to. Nobody was worried because at that age, 1920, 22, uh, nothing's going to happen to you personally. It's always going to be someone else. So our expectations were that, yes, we would be meeting the Viet Cong uh, sooner rather than later. Any time that uh, we got out of the aircraft, in fact, we were you know, quite looking forward to it. Next thing, we were whizzing along the highway and they seemed to have absolutely no concern for human life or property in the way they drove this bus with the mesh up at the windows and somebody sort of asked the question, you know, what, why do we, what are we fenced in for? And then they indicated that uh, that was to keep the hand grenades out and we shut up then. When we arrived at Bienvoir Air Base, we were astounded to see that we were being put into a enormous grassy paddock and there were no trees or anything the highly trained australian jungle scientists to tie their little tents to earlier this week hmas sydney with its load of troops and equipment slipped quietly out of harbour on the first stage of its long voyage to south vietnam and with its departure the commitment of australia to the war going on there began in earnest There were interminable classes. My recollection is most of them were health classes. It was, oh, well, identification of the enemy and health classes. For God's sake, you know, stay away from, from, from the women up there because you, there's, there's strains of VD and gonorrhea you would not believe, you know, and you'll never come home and you'll be stuck in a hospital for the rest of your life. It was actually a little bit frightening because uh, we'd had uh, the briefing from the intelligence people uh, I think Major Peter Young, if I recall, came up to tell us about these Viet Cong. And uh, we were actually convinced that these fellows were 10 feet tall and that they could probably cut your throat with their toenails. When I arrived at shore at Vang Tower, I was pretty sure I was in a war and um, I could feel the war was all around me. Well, one RAI went to Vietnam to be attached to an American brigade. Uh, we were attached then to 173rd at Bien Hoa, whose task was to defend the Benoit Air airbase against the Viet Cong attack. So initially that was our task. We haven't got a problem really, just we've got to get used to the American uh, idea. We seem to do things different than they do. Uh, it's interesting working with them. We've never worked with them before. We thought they were a very good and elite group of soldiers. After we arrived, we found that uh, in fact they knew next to nothing about jungle warfare as we understood it. Uh, the big cultural difference, I think, was uh, one, we believed in, in patience, planning and stealth, whereas I think the Americans wanted to get the war over very quickly, and so theirs was mainly bravado and aggression. When 
they come back here to camp. It's a bad time we call it home at times. It's good to get back here for a bit of a rest, although they still have pickets to do and so on. We get our issue of beer, which is uh, perhaps the best recreation for most of us in this uh, hot, dry, dusty weather. In uh, early 66, the Americans realised that uh, the headquarters of the Vietcong and their both the logistic operations uh, headquarters were in the Hobo Woods somewhere. Uh, it had been a, a place that the Viet Minh had used in, uh, in French times and that it was laced with tunnels and this is all they knew. And the idea was, was the Australians had land along the line of the villages and block while the American battalions landed on the other side and preceded by a B-52 strike would sweep through the rubber plantations, capture this headquarters and score a glorious victory. Uh, we, went into, we went into the Hobo, Hobo Woods on the 8th of January. Um, from the, basically, from the moment we got off the helicopters, um, we started getting contacts. We did run into one foolish uh, fellow who wanted to engage us uh, with his uh, uh, small arms fire, and he suddenly found that there was uh, 22 soldiers advancing towards him with uh, two or three helicopters sitting off uh, 50 yards to the rear of us, and after thinking about it for a little while, he decided to throw the weapon away and uh, disappear. They, they turned the corner about 30 feet from me, and uh, I think I looked away or something at that particular time. And then when I turned around, I realised that the first, the first guy in this patrol that was coming back was a Viet Cong. And we didn't know at the time, but... Uh, this washout had a tunnel running along the side of it and a series of firing slits and the enemy proceeded to uh, fire at uh, my soldiers very close range. And uh, Corporal Smith got uh, hit, uh, Private Delaney got hit. And by the time I raised the machine gun up to, um, to fire, it was about a foot and a half from the front of the machine gun. I pulled the trigger, he had another six or seven guys behind him. And when I fired the rounds, they were, I was watching through the sights and they were just pouring into his head and his head was just exploding. Uh, but the, the fire from the machine gun was actually holding this guy up. It wasn't allowing him to fall onto the ground. We continued to push forward and uh, I think, uh, Around about that time, uh, I went out to help Delaney and as I was pulling him back uh, into some shelter, I got hit from about uh, uh, very close range, a couple of inches. I ended up with powder burns on my lip uh, and I dropped Delaney in front of the slit. It wasn't until after then that the shock started to hit me as I started wiping bits of his brains and so forth like that off the end of my machine gun. Um, that's why Hobo Woods, I don't remember much of what happened through the rest of the time of Hobo Woods because my mind was taken up with what had occurred at that particular time. I thought I might as well try and do my job while I was there. In fact, I, I was terrified, to be quite honest. <laughs> I recall almost uh, having the feeling that I wanted to run, but uh, I suppose because someone had educated me sufficiently, I. I didn't run. I, I wasn't quite sure whether I was going to make it at that stage, but they threw me on a, on a chopper. I was sitting on a dicky seat on the side, and there was this big black American sergeant. There was his machine gun there as a door gunner. And he was obviously the crew chief, because he said to me, he said, uh, hey, guy, would you like a copy of the Stars and Stripes? Well, here I am, you know, my both eyes are closed, and there's blood pouring out my mouth. And I said to him, I said, hey, I can't read. And he said, I don't want you to read it. I want you to put it on the floor because your blood's messing my helicopter up. <laughs> Mungle. <laughs> uh, anyway. I regret that when we actually searched this guy, that he was only 18 years old. And to put that into context, I was only just 19 as well. You know, 
There's only 20, out of the 22 blokes in my platoon that went out in that operation after it was uh, wound up three or four days later, they, uh, there was only 11 of them that walked back and the rest had holes in them. The most frightening things that, that hit us as soon as we hit the Hobo Woods, particularly at the LZ, we ran into these extensive tunnel systems that we were not expecting. The tunnels... Uh... Good evening and welcome to True Stories. Tonight we look at the Vietnam conflict through the eyes of Australian men and women. Relive their experiences and emotions in The Sharp End, Witnesses of Vietnam. Our military power continues to grow. This power is for our own defense and to deter aggression. We shall not be aggressors, but we and our allies have and will maintain a massive capability to strike back. President, have you ever had any reason to doubt this so-called domino theory? I believe it. I think that the uh, struggle is close enough. China is so large, room so high on the just beyond the frontier. The South Vietnam went. It would not only give them an improved geographic position for a guerrilla assault on Malaya, it would also give the impression that the way of the future in Southeast Asia is China and the Communists. I don't think that uh, the true Australian wants safety on the cheap. Nor does he want to leave everything to other people. It's abundantly clear that Australia must be prepared to do its share. And I'm perfectly certain that that will be agreeable to Australian opinion. Renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. When uh, conscription was introduced, I was, uh, I took it as being just another part of my life and uh, we'd move on into a, 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 another adventure. Um, I was looking forward to it. Well, I don't think I liked the idea of it anyway, taking the young fellas away when they had so many regular soldiers. I was a volunteer and uh, I was glad that I volunteered to serve the colours. I had to register for the very first uh, ballot at the beginning of 65 and uh, I was quite shocked. I, at that stage, I wasn't uh, um, necessarily a post conscription it's, itself, but the first thing I asked myself was, you know, what am I being conscripted for? I felt quite threatened that a busload of women would arrive at the gates of Pukapanya with their banners, save our sons. We used to hand out leaflets uh, saying, uh, you have a right to be conscious as projector. Uh, and just as the uh, young men were going through the gates, one turned round to me and said, I don't want to go, I've changed my mind, will you help me? The troops that went there volunteered to go. I mean, I don't care what anyone says, they were given a chance to pull out and nothing would have been said. Well, he did like the idea of it. He did like the idea of going away. But he said that he, he wasn't a coward, he said his number come out, so he'd go. I went to uh, fight the communist aggressor from the north, as Bob Menzies kept on telling us all the time. Well, to stop them coming down there and running into Australia. Then early in 1965, we were told that we were going to join the 1st Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment and we drove from Holsworthy to Richmond Air Base 
I don't think there's a lot of apprehension because uh, we were volunteers for the regular army and this is what we trained to do. So we wanted to get into the planes and get up to Vietnam and see if we were any good. We had trained and trained hard and trained well and, and more importantly trained together. And uh, I believe we were as well trained as we could be. Dominant memory, dom dominant record. That, that it was essential for him to have the support of the people. He could obtain food medical supplies, he could obtain labour when he wanted it, and recruits for his army. He could also, most importantly, merge with the people so that we, the foreigners, could not determine friend from foe. It's just continuous patrolling. We, we, we spent half a year in the jungle, and uh, the only time you've seen them bastards was well, when they, they let go a burst of AK-47 down the centre of it. Buzzing past your ears. When you're in contact with somebody, um, it becomes very personalised. If someone's trying to kill you, or you're trying to kill them. You can feel as if um, you may be going to the happy hunting ground at any time. Now, you were there five minutes ago, and now you're not. And in half an hour, I'm wrapping you up in a poncho and sending you home. That is bad news. There was a bang, and I went up and through the air, and I can remember dust and the ringing in my ears, and everybody's screaming for medics and dust off helicopters, and I just left lying there looking into the sun. You were, you were halting the deterioration of the soldier's medical condition, as, or surgical condition, as much as possible so that they were alive until they got to the uh, hospital. You stopped bleeding, you filled in sucking chest wounds so that that, uh, that didn't kill them on the trip. The role for the dust off for our aircraft was no more difficult than the standard mission that you happen to be flying at the time. You'd pick up the, uh, the patient, take him to the nearest hospital or the head hospital if necessary. That was a big morale booster for uh, the troop on the ground because he knew darn well if he got hurt, he had a fair chance of being pulled out very quickly and he could be in a hospital within 10 or 15 minutes. The dust off system was a very efficient system. Uh, we would have warning wherever we were around the hospital as the choppers were coming in. Well, I actually thought I'd woken up in a storeroom, but um, I realised now it was night time and they used to use Christmas tree lights for night lighting. And that's what made me think I was in a storeroom because I thought I'd been put out the back with the leftover Christmas decorations. I knew back out on the minefield that I'd lost my leg, that, that I just felt that my leg had been blown off. And I can remember saying to the nurse, have I lost my leg? And she went into a little bit of a panic and said, I'll get the doctor, I'll get the doctor to talk to you. One particular case I remember with a mine was a young lieutenant who stepped backwards onto a, um, a mine. And when he came in on the helicopter, uh, he didn't appear to be grossly damaged until we lifted him from the uh, stretcher. And at that stage, it was obvious that the mine had sheared most of his back away. Because the mines contained um, pellets of lead, nails, anything that could be bought, um, airborne when it was exploded, so that they had many, many multiple fragment wounds. And so it might not just be an arm or a leg, it would be the whole body. In our hospital, the, uh, there was only one trained operating theatre nurse and the rest of the lads were uh, medical assistants trained as operating theatre technicians. I can recall that we had a, a farmer, a uh, shoe salesman, Peter and Turner, a couple of uni students who had uh, been called up into national service and in one year had been trained as medical assistants and then operating theatre technicians. I think that uh, it asked an awful lot of these young people, you know, to see uh, such terrible, terrible wounds and uh, I think they acquitted themselves marvellously. Many Australians, like many Americans, disagree with President Johnson's actions in Vietnam. But those who agree must wonder what Australia would do if there was a dramatic switch in American policy. I hope uh, there will be a corner of your mind and heart which takes cheer from the fact that you have an admiring friend, a staunch friend, that will be all the way with LBJ. I recall going to bed and, oh, about one o'clock in the morning, I hear the pop, 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 which was a little bit different. Uh, it sort of uh, uh, let me feel that they were incoming rounds, and sure enough, they were, and they started landing somewhere around the task force area. 
you don't usually put a mortar attack in unless you're going to do something else with it. So, you know, and the, uh, the, the natural thing to do is put in... Um, we're absolutely massive. It grew day by day by day. After two days, the fellows who were clearing them were absolutely worn out. So the boss then decided, was all hands to the pump, and uh, suddenly the smiling radio operators were down the holes as well, and we weren't then smiling, I can tell you. Yeah, well, the earliest techniques of going down tunnels was, first of all, going down head first, with a bayonet in one hand and a torch in the other. And, of course, this meant that we had no protection. Once you did enter the tunnel, it was elongated. It was like getting into a coffin. We didn't really understand the importance of tunnels and how big this was and all this sort of stuff, you know, until until we pulled out so much intelligence, you know, like 100,000 sheets of paper we pulled out of this, besides all the tons and tons of explosives. So you'd come along down the first tunnel and you'd find a trapdoor. Once you cleared that, you'd go down to the next tier, which was straight down. Then you'd crawl along and you'd find another trapdoor. It wasn't until all the... Um, uh, information was disseminated and looked at by the by the intelligence organizations that they said hey this is really valuable stuff turned right and the torch lot all i saw was two eyes looking at me and i shot back around the corner and i thought what's that so i put a pistol around the corner and i put the torch around when i switched it on there was a dog sitting there buddy growling at me so i promptly got a bit frustrated and put nine rounds into it we actually searched these tunnel systems for five days. And at the end of that time, they were going in both directions, still completing. We searched out three quarters of a mile. What else could you do? Because you didn't know what was going on. Who was there? You just snuck along nice and careful and kept your pistol ready. We were part of a major force of, uh, uh, of 173rd Airborne Brigade, so we were only one battalion group, and as such, uh, we were told that we were needed to withdraw because the whole of the brigade is withdrawing. Wow, were well, we disappointed to withdraw. <laughs> I wasn't disappointed, I can tell you that right now. But they tell me there was 5,000 fully armed troops down there. Thank Christ they kept moving. The 1st Battalion. Royal Australian Regiment marched through the streets of Sydney on the 8th of June 1966 to a tumultuous welcome. There was a lady who covered herself in red paint and ran into the CO and uh, I think that was, was a real eye-opener to a lot of fellows that there was that depth of opposition. Can you see any limit to the extent of our military commitment to South Vietnam? Um, I don't believe that our military commitment to South Vietnam would, can in the present situation, go much beyond the present commitment. Over the next year, the Army worked towards assembling a task force. At the same time, the Americans were asking us for more troops, and Harold Holt finally gave his agreement that a task force be sent. And it wasn't until the government made the announcement that the battalion got all the priority it needed to be filled up with troops and get all the priority in training. And in fact, we, we had about 90 days from that announcement until we were ready to go. Uh, 1966, we were the first, uh, first ones into the movie that. Uh, the impressions when I arrived, nice scenery, nice rubber plantation, where are we going to live? Um, and they virtually said, well, when you get something built, that's where you're going to live. Uh, the food was uh, terrible, the accommodation was uh, basically butchies and eventually 16 um, to 16 tents. But the, uh, because it was a monsoon season, the mud was everywhere. Uh, and the, uh, the weapon pits were full of water. Well, patrolling is the bread and butter of the infantry man. Uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's more style bread than butter, and you, uh, it's, it's very boring and very repetitive, and it's uh, something that's just done day after day after day carrying something like a hundred pounds of equipment that seems determined to cut through your shoulders. You're hungry all the time, you're thirsty all the time, tired all the time, of course. And when combat comes, you have to face the ridiculous task of trying to run through jungle carrying a hundred pounds or more of equipment, knowing full well that the people you're fighting are carrying half a dozen rounds of ammunition in their pocket and couldn't quite easily outrun you. The enemy worked on the principle